Welcome to the finale of the 2024 Advent of Code, and happy 10 years of AOC. So despite some of the challenges and setbacks that we've experienced this year together, specifically referring to the whole LLM problem, it's overall been a great year and a great decade, and I've really enjoyed doing the Advent of Code. I wasn't around doing the AOC back when it first started, but I went back and solved most of the problems, and it's been a very enjoyable time. The part I've enjoyed most though, honestly, is interacting with the community, and so thank you all for making this experience so amazing. I really wouldn't still be making videos, and honestly I might have given up on doing Advent of Code if it weren't for all of you and all of your support, so thank you all for being a part of this. For today's problem, we've decided that we're just going to go back and check the Chief Historian's office one last time in case he returned there without us noticing. We get there and we discover that the office is locked, and we can hear that there's someone inside, but there's no response from knocking. Here's a fun easter egg, knocking yields no response. Yield is a keyword in a couple of languages. This tooltip is most likely JavaScript. In Python, the yield function works similar to return, but a function can call yield multiple times, and it becomes a generator, which returns a an object that you can loop through. So, as an easy example, if we make a function that generates all integers starting from x, then if we loop through it, and let's say generate all numbers starting from 4, then you see that we would start by printing 4 and then print every other number increasing by 1 each time. Basically, each time the function yields, it returns to this loop and provides the next value. And then once we ask the generator for the next value, it goes back in where it left off and continues the function. We've unfortunately lost track of which locks are installed and which keys go with them. So we're basically going to just try to brute force all of the combinations. So we're going to send over the schematics of every lock and every key for our current floor, which is our puzzle input. These schematics are provided in a sort of diagram, and these are five pin tumbler locks. Basically, there are five pins that must be pushed up to the shear line. This is the exact same way that locks work in real life, and there is a Wikipedia article linked. This is probably the lock you're all the most familiar with. Essentially, inside each cylinder, there are a bunch of pins on top called the driver pins, which are spring-loaded from the top and a bunch of red pins called the key pins. And when you insert a key, it pushes up each pin by a certain amount based on the cutouts in the key. And then once all of the pins have been pushed such that the gap between the key pin and driver pin aligns with the shear line, you can rotate the plug, which is the inside cylinder, which allows you to open the lock. So these are some schematics. And in this example, this would be a lock with the pins pointing down, and this would be a key with the with the ridges pointing up. The locks have the top row filled and the bottom row empty, and the keys have the top row empty and the bottom row filled. And we see that each schematic is a set of five columns of various heights, either extending down from the top for locks or up from the bottom for keys. For the lock diagrams, those are the pins, and so you can convert them to a list of heights, one per column. So in this example, we say that the first lock has pin heights 0, 5, 3, 4, 3, which is the number of pound signs except for the top row, which is the baseline. And the first key has heights 5, 0, 2, 1, 3, which is the height in pound signs except for the bottom, which you could take to be the key's like main body. These seem like these should fit together. And in the first four columns, the pins and keys don't overlap, but in the last one, they would overlap in this position. And so we want to narrow down the keys that we need to try by testing each key with each lock. And so, for example, if we convert both locks to pin heights and all three keys to key heights, we get these three, sorry, these five values. And then if we try every combination, we can see that there are three lock and key combinations where all columns fit. Note that this does not mean that the key and the lock actually line up, it just means that there is no overlap. So we want to see how many possible combinations overlap. So let's move on to this problem. 
So there are two ways of doing this. The easy way is to convert each lock and key to a height and then check each combination. The slightly weirder way that I can think of is to actually just keep the locks and keys as grids and just actually overlay them and see which ones don't overlap. So let's try both. We're going to take the input and read all of it. That's what this does. And then we're going to split it on double new lines because each diagram will have double new lines between them. And then for each block in that list of strings, the block split across split into individual lines is going to be our grid. Now we want to count how many pound signs are in each column, but right now our grid comes in a list of rows. So what we can do here is we can use the Python zip function. I've talked about this a couple of times, but just introduce this again. If we zip multiple lists, let's suppose our example has 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, 9. Then when we take the zip of these three lists, it'll iterate through them column by column. If there are any extra columns with some blank values, then that column will be completely ignored. So in this case, our first group would be a tuple 0, 4, 7. Our second tuple is 1, 5, 8, and our third is 2, 6, 9. This works perfectly for what we want because we want to get the columns. And so we're going to say grid equals zip block dot split lines. And one caveat is that zip doesn't take a list of lists. It takes each list in an individual argument. So we're going to use the splat operator, which basically takes some list and spreads its arguments out across the parameters of a function. Finally, this returns a zip object, which isn't too helpful for us, so we can convert it into a list. And now we get a list of tuples for each grid, and now the tuples are all columns. So if the first, if the top left corner, which is the first element of the first array, is a pound sign, that means that the pound signs are at the top, which makes this a lock. And if the top left corner is a dot, that means that it's a key. So if the first element of the grid is a pound sign, then it's a lock. So we're going to add the pin heights of this lock to the array. The way we'll do that is by counting the number of pound signs in each row, and then subtracting one because of the baseline. Otherwise, we do the same, but for the keys, and it just so happens that it's actually the same thing for the key heights. Now we just need to look at all of the combinations. There's no smarter way around this than just looping through each pair. So we can just do total equals zero for lock in box, for key in keys. What's the condition here? Well, we need to check if the sum of the pin height and the corresponding key height are no greater than five. Because there are five gap spaces here, we can see that there's a gap of five. The top line is the pin baseline, or sorry, the lock baseline, and the bottom line is the key baseline. There's a total of five gap spaces, and so the pin height and the key height cannot add up to more than five. In order to do this, we want to iterate through each pair of respective pins and key ridges. And so this again is a use case for a zip. If we zip the lock with the key together, we get an iteration through every corresponding pair of lock and key values. So now if we loop through each pair for x, y, n, zip, lock, key, we just need x plus y to be less than or equal to five. And if this is true for all of these items, then we add one to our total to give us our answer for part one. Now, there are actually many ways you could do this. So, for example, you could count the dots instead, which would count the gaps. So, in that case, you would need to make sure that the sum is not less than five, because you need a total of five gaps between the two of them. You can see in this first column, all five are gaps. 
in the third column, for example, this one has two, the lock has two gaps and the key has three gaps. In the last one, there are only four total gaps. So this is basically the same thing. That works too. You could also, for example, count the lock heights and the key, the lock heights as pound signs and the key heights as dots. And that way, what you're making sure is that the number of dots in the key is not less than the number of pound signs in the lock, as that would correspond to an intersection. So it's something like x is greater than or equal to y, I think. No, I got that wrong. I might have that backwards, actually. Yeah, so that would work too. You could also do the reverse. It really depends on what you think makes the most sense. I think converting it like this makes the most sense just because that's what the example says, and so you can debug more easily. But when I initially started looking at the reason I mentioned this possibility in the first place is because when I first started looking at this problem, I was thinking that the key number in real keys is actually higher the deeper down it's cut. So when you cut a key, what happens is you take the key, which initially looks something like this, and then you cut ridges into it based on how deep you want to go. The higher the number, the deeper the cut. So this is actually backwards from real life key numbering systems. So that's why I kind of thought jump my mind jumped to working on it backwards first. But of course for the problem's time constraint, it makes sense to just do it the way that they provided. But that's why I mentioned this possibility. Finally, there is also that thing I mentioned earlier, where instead of storing the key heights, we actually just store the grid directly. So we can say like locks dot append grid keys dot append grid and so now our lock and key are stored as actual grids and we try to superimpose them to see if they overlap this is going to get a bit complicated but bear with me we're going to zip the lock with the key but since the lock and the key are now grids then we will get pairs of rows here so for x y in zip lock key we're actually getting pairs of rows so then we can do for a b in zip x y which now makes this entire thing loop a, b through each pair in lock key in 2D. And then we can just say if all a equals dot or b equals dot, then we increase the total by 1. Because if neither of them are dots, then that means that they're both pound signs. You could also do if not any a equals b equals pound sign. That works too. You'll note that this takes a bit of delay to run because this is obviously inefficient, but the problem asks about overlapping, so I just wanted to share this possibility. A final way you could do this is if you add up all of the... If you su What this is doing is grid is a list of tuples, so if we sum them all to the empty tuple, then we basically just flatten grid into one flat list, which prevents us from having to do this double zip. And that would work too. You see that this is marginally faster, I believe, but really not much to matter. In any case, a couple of ways to approach this problem, but all of those work for part one. Relatively straightforward, relatively easy problem, which is pretty classic for day 25. As is tradition, on day 25, the second part of the problem is just to press a button. So let's just read through this flavor text together and enjoy our last video for this year. We turn, we crowd into the office, startling the chief historian awake. We all take turns looking confused until one of them asks where he's been for the last few months. He says he's been right here working on a high priority request from Santa, thinking that the only time he stepped away was about a month ago when he went to grab a cup of coffee. Just then he notices the time and he says, oh no, I'm going to be late. I must have fallen asleep trying to put the finishing touches on this chronicle Santa requested. But now I don't have time to go visit the last 50 places on the list and complete the chronicle before he leaves. One of the historians holds up the list they've been using the whole time to keep track of where they've been searching, and we've checked off every place with a star, which are the things we earn for completing parts of the problems. Other historians hold up their notes, of course being historians, they couldn't resist writing everything down while visiting all those significant places. 
And the chief's eyes get wide, and he says, With all this, we might just have enough time to finish the chronicle. Santa said he want it wrapped up with a bow, so I'll call down to the wrapping department, and hey, could you bring it up to Santa? I'll need to be in my seat to watch the sleigh launch by then. And so gladly, we quickly work to collect the notes into the final set of pages for the Chronicle. If you have finished all other 49 stars, then you can deliver the Chronicle. If you don't have all 49 stars, then you will need to go back and solve the previous problems. And once you deliver the Chronicle, you have solved the problem. And with that, this year is complete. All that's left for us to do is admire the Advent Calendar and reminisce on how far we've come this year. I'm hoping that next year we will be able to make some progress on addressing the LLM problem and continuing to keep up the spirit of the challenge and make this problem fun for all human participants who want to actually participate and hone their skills. But thank you all for watching. I would like to make a couple of reminders. Firstly, I'll include my sponsor link for CodeCrafters in the description again. CodeCrafters, in case you're not familiar, is a platform where you get real example coding challenges and projects where you can, for example, make a Git clone in a language of your choosing. It's a great way to practice coding. A lot of people ask me how I learned coding, and when I go to learn Rust, that's going to be my go-to method. There's still time this year if you sign up with my affiliate link for the rest of December, you'll get access to all of the problems for free for a week. Additionally, I'm running a giveaway on behalf of CodeCrafters for a lifetime subscription, two three-month subscriptions, and three one-month subscriptions to the platform. If you're interested in that, please check out one of my recent community posts about that. All you need to do is sign up and comment your GitHub handle and a reason you love Advent of Code on that post. You don't have to upgrade your account, and when I go to draw the winners, paying for Upgrading your account for a subscription will not give any advantage. Finally, I will be doing a recap stream on popular demand. A lot of people have asked me to do a stream covering some of the interesting problems again from this year. So I'm going to be doing that this Friday sometime in the evening. I will keep you posted. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the notification. I'll announce this on my Discord server and in a community post and we'll go over some of the problems this year, specifically the ones where there were some improvements, corrections, or interesting optimizations to be had. Again, thank you so much for a great year, and thank you for your support throughout the years. I hope you enjoyed this video and this series, and I'll see you again sometime.